good stuff. So uh, we're talking on a nice summer evening here. Um, you know, I, I guess we're both working on our tans a little bit, um, or maybe maybe we need to do that because uh, I'm uh, I'm spending too much time uh, with those. You know, the YouTube ring lights kind of shining yeah. in my eyes. I don't know if that is going to have some sort of long term effect um, on our vision, but I've got one like every desk space. I even have a travel one that I throw in my backpack. I don't know. Do, do you use those at all? For your no, calls, I just spend much more, no, I, I spend more of my time outside, man. I just get my coffee in the morning and just sit in the sun and nice. catch up on my emails while the sun is, uh, when the sun's coming up and it's probably the best place to be in early mornings. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know what? I, I, I see that happening more frequently, more people taking calls outside on their back deck. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits that's kind of come out of, uh, out of this whole thing that we've that we've gone through, and uh, I try to make it a point of not talking about the pandemic because we're here to talk about way more exciting stuff. But uh, but yeah, you you see more people in their natural environment, which I think is cool. It's 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 a new way to connect with people. Speaking of that, so Reed Reed Hannon, um, you are the CEO of My Abilities amongst uh, other companies. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, My Abilities today. Uh, before we get into the company side of things. Reed, tell me a little bit about like what's the most interesting thing that you've done recently uh, that that you would, if you were at a party, you would you would talk about. Well, it's uh, I've done a lot of stuff that's uh, recently, but my most interesting probably goes back a, a number of years. If you want to go back a little bit, mm-hmm. um, yeah. it's when on my honeymoon when I got married, my wife wanted to uh, scuba dive and and get her scuba diving license and. I didn't tell her I don't know how to swim. <laughs> wow! So I said, I said, okay, let's get let's get let's get certified. <laughs> oh my god! And, and we did. We took lessons. And part of part of the test is that you got to go in in the ocean. You got to tread water for like five minutes before you can actually go dive. Oh my god! So gosh. I said, yeah, sure, honey, let's do that. It's my honeymoon, right? You're excited. You want to impress your new bride. Yeah, and I figured, okay, you know what? I'll figure this out on my way out there. And then we went out there in the ocean, and I was walking and walking and walking, and I'm saying, God, please send me something to help me out because I'm not know how to tread water. It's getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> oh my God! And I, then, I, then I then I stumbled on a, on a boulder in uh, in middle of nowhere. Yeah. So I, I I sort of walked up to it, and I stood on the boulder on my tippy toes, and and I I. Just had enough distance to be able to get some some air and breathe and not really have to tread. Oh my and gosh! Everybody was and everybody was working hard treading water, and I was out there saying, "Look, honey, look, I could tread with one hand. Never mind <laughs> two hands." <laughs> and she thought that was so impressive that I could actually tread water, and I had no idea what I was doing. But I uh, I, passed, I I passed that test and I got certified. And then we went diving. We dove down 60 feet and uh, I, you know, I pulled it off and she thought I was pretty impressive. So that's, uh, that's wow. Like talk about courage, eh? Um, yeah. And uh, some ingenuity there. So that like, and that didn't, did that affect you at all when you had to go down into that oceanic environment? Was it in your head playing with you at all that, hey, I'm a guy who can't swim or was yeah, that just totally. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. I said, like, I wonder when I'm gonna die. Like, any second I'm gonna die. But I just get married, and my wife is my bride is watching me, and I'm I've gotta I gotta pull this off. And wow, I found every ounce of energy that I could possibly uh, scrape and put them all yeah. together. And I said, look, I gotta do this, and, yeah. and I did. And then, and the scariest part is when you dive to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Part of the test is you've got to take off your scuba gear. You got to take off your mask. You got to yeah. take off your octopus that's in your mouth and put it all back on and right. you're sitting at the bottom of the ocean, 60 feet below water. It's like, it's daunting, but wow. you know, the, the adrenaline kicks in, uh, the coach is watching you, you, you know, your wife's up there and you go, no, no, I got this, you know, I can do this. And, and I did. So. That's fantastic. Like, you know, yeah. and there's, there, there's some amazing business metaphors there. Like that, I think, describe someone who was born to be an entrepreneur you just like you saw something you knew you could do it you you had you had motivation you had your bride watching you and yeah. 
and you went for it and and you succeeded. You're obviously here to talk to tell the story. <laughs> I'm, still, so I'm that, still breathing. <laughs> I'm and, 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 and you know, none of this is rehearsed. Like I'm I'm in yeah. shock just hearing that because like I like personally, I consider myself a strong swimmer. I've never scuba dived. Yeah. I've snorkeled. Yeah. And I'm not even really comfortable snorkeling, to be honest with you. I, I prefer just yeah. natural swimming and I can stay under for a long time. But that is just absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you could apply that to so many different situations, right? Where you just say, I'm going to figure this out as I go. Um, and yeah, talk about like the the risks though. Um, so would you yeah. say you're not a risk averse? Like, or would you say, yeah, that you're not a risk averse person? Like you... Oh, geez. No, the more risk, the better, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you had to... Yeah, I think the trick, the the really the, the theme is like, don't even think about the risk because if you have to spend too much time analyzing the risk, yeah, you probably find a lot of reasons why not you shouldn't be doing what you want to do. Everything, whether it's, yeah. Whether it's scuba diving, whether it's driving fast, whether it's starting a business or, you know, yeah. you name it, right? Just going yeah. for a walk. Like sure. we could all could get hit by a car crossing the street going for a walk, but yeah. we don't think about that. We just go for a walk because we want to enjoy walking. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I look at business and I look at lifestyle. I look at just being alive. It's the same way. It's like, look, just, just do it. And, and yeah. whatever, whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's really not within your control. Right. Right. I love that attitude. So, so now that you've done something incredible like that, because <clears throat> I was going to follow up with a question like what's on your bucket list that you really want to do, but you, you just can't seem to, to get around to whether it's time, uh, I don't think courage is an issue for you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, is, is there is there a big thing on your on your bucket list that you're like, or not even a bucket list, but it's just like I I've always said I wanted to do X, but I just haven't been able to find a way to make that work yet. Yeah, no, I really want to travel the world. I really want to see different parts of the world and spend a few months in every country. Yeah, yeah. And really try to learn the culture and and sort of um, you know disseminate into the the, the the local area. And and maybe learn some of the language and kind of live the way they live and 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 be yeah. at par with them with the locals and understand their thinking and mm-hmm. and how they live and but yeah, yeah understand their pain and what they go through day in day out. We've yeah. got such a preconceived notion of what's happening in the rest of the world out there. And we only see it through through public media, mm-hmm. and it's always a tainted view, right? We never really get to understand the locals and how they feel, and we certainly never get the emotional side of things. Yeah. So being there and, and speaking to the locals and, and staying in their places and eating where they eat and, and doing what they mm-hmm. do day in, day out for a little period of time. Yeah. I think that would be a phenomenal experience that I think all of us could 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 have benefit from for and sort of learn from. Yeah. And bring some of that back. Bring that back and say, look, you know, there's there's yeah. a lot more happening in the world than it within our social circles and our communities. It's yeah. a big world that we live in, right? We live in our own towns, but mm-hmm. that's that's a that's a microcosm of our planet, but yes. our planet is a big place, and there's more than one of us, right? There's seven plus billion of us yeah. out there. Yeah, and you know what's the rest of us doing, and and how are they managing and coping and and yeah. dealing with life situations or whatever the case may be? I think that would be a phenomenal experience that all of us should have to do at some point of our life, just to get a better understanding of how yeah, the rest yeah. of us live. That's really cool. I love that perspective. Like that's a uh you got to be a really curious person. I think to crave something like that, I can really, really relate to that. When I travel, I don't like staying on resorts. I don't like staying even near a hotel. If we're wherever it is that I'm putting my head down, I'd like to wander around and see what people are doing, uh, observe and absorb the culture, the community, uh, the different lifestyle. And, uh, I think you're right. And it's funny, there's some parallels there, again, to business, but even in the insure tech space, you know, when we started this community, I started this community earlier this year. And, you know, it wasn't just to be Canada centric and say Canada knows everything. It's the opposite. In fact, we need to learn uh, from other global uh, communities um, and understand what they're doing well, but also showcase what we're really doing well and our talent and how we can contribute and 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 learn from from what others are doing, um, because yeah, we we only know what's happening in our own backyard, uh, and we're we're a small country. What's really cool though is is we're also a rich mosaic of a blend of a lot of different cultures. Um, so there's there's certainly a lot to learn, and I'm excited about the future. That that's a really cool thing though. Um, what you just said there, Reed. So 
Um, let's talk a little bit about on the business side, uh, your origin story. So like, how did you get into, would you, would you call yourself an insurance guy, a career insurance guy, or are you more, more of a serial entrepreneur that kind of ran into insurance accidentally? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, you know, I started in the fitness business in 1984 mm-hmm. and started one of Canada's first uh, fitness club uh, franchise called Golden Gym at the time. Okay. Um, Lennox Lewis actually started his boxing career, my club. Um, you know, oh, wow. Lennox and I used to, we used to spar and, <laughs> and you know, he, he asked me if I could sponsor him. Um, he was 17 years old and I said, Lennox, please, man, you're so skinny and you know, where do you think you're going to go in the boxing world? Wow. That was a set of a bad call in my end. I should have sponsored it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I started I started on that, and we had a club in Toronto um, that did offered boxing and fitness and training and, and sold exercise equipment to employers in, in for their wellness programs. And I was contacted by Honda because we had set up the wellness programs, uh, Honda Canada up uh, in the Alliston area, yeah, and they were they were expanding their Alliston plant. Um, this goes back to early nineties, I think it was. Then I remember, forget the date now, but it was I think it was ninety ninety nine or so. Okay, and and their senior VP of HR said, "Look, you know, we we like what you've done with our wellness program and the mm-hmm. equipment. We're trying to plant the new plant and hire five thousand employees. Can you uh, help us build some testing protocols and technology and solutions that we can actually hire the right people for the job to make sure that we don't get, we don't hire the, the wrong fit individuals mm. and, and increase our workers' comp costs and disability costs. And I said, yeah, uh, tell me specifically what you guys want. And, and I'll get my team to kind of map out a strategy, a technology and a product and give me 90 days to kind of figure out. And, and we did. Um, you know, 90 days later, we built a technology that uh, we deployed within the Honda plant and we screened on our technology um, almost 8,000 applicants um, for jobs. And they only hired less than half of them because the other the other uh, half didn't quite meet the demands of the jobs that we, we were testing for. Right. And it was extremely successful. Um, it was so successful, like within two years, um, their workers' comp costs and injury costs were so low that it got the attention of Honda uh, Japan. And wow. the CEO of Honda Japan flew down and said, what is it that you guys are doing that's so perfect? Because your, your workers' comp costs and disability costs are lower than anybody else out there. Right. And they, they talked about our program, our, our screening technology, and our solutions and our software. And, and he said, this is pretty cool. And then we had a the mandate to deploy it into other locations. And, and at the time, they sort of mandated so that all Honda providers adopt the same type of technology and platform. And that was sort of our entry into the disability management, injury prevention, um, you know, insurance type solutions that we worked right. with employers directly. And that's how we sort of started uh, my last, our previous company called Hanun Medical. Okay. Now that's those are the technologies that we built and, and developed and, and launched into not just Honda, but a lot of other you know large Canadian brands like Costa Scooter Lane. We went to BMW and Anheuser Busch and, and expanded from there right into across Canada into the US. Um, and those technologies are still in use today. And we end up selling those technologies to other providers, but they're still in application as uh, as we speak. Uh, that's being incredible. used by Occupational health physicians being used by physical therapy clinics, being used by insurance companies, yeah. being used by employers, uh, right across North America. So that's how I got into the space. That's really cool, and and I, I love how you're you know part of that story. You're on the prevention side as well as the disability management side, um, and yeah. I don't know if that's common or rare. Um, I also like the fact that. It sounds like you you know you came at it from an entrepreneurial standpoint using technology but you weren't an insurance person and an insurance industry uh, guy per se. Um, Did that, um, was that an obstacle for you at all? Did you feel like it was harder for you to, or because of the backing of Honda, um, having that strong backing from them, that kind of opened the door for you? Um, It's a a bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. I still run into the same challenges we have today. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a lot of employers that use our technology, um, the current technology under my abilities brand. 
yeah. for prevention and injury management and return to work. Mm-hmm. Um, the challenge we run into is, is we're trying to change the way the industry does what it does. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talk to carriers and they're still, for the most part, um, you know, phone calling physicians and mm. they're calling employers and they're faxing. They're, people are still faxing information out and, and getting faxes back. And our yeah. technology is a, is a web-based, digital-based platform that shares data in real time. Yeah. Um, if an injury occurs, you can actually look up a job description from our software like seconds after the claim is filed and share that with the employer and then share that with the physician or the treating practitioner to say, hey, if you want to restore the function or the yeah. claim, whatever the case may be, you know, here's the bench line that we're trying to restore to. Yeah. Right. We don't want this injured worker back to becoming superhero because he wasn't, you know, pre-accident mm-hmm. and it doesn't really impact his demands of his job. Yeah. We just want to restore functions so they can meet the advance of those jobs. Right. Um, and we've got that at their fingertips. And then they're saying, well, no, we like to send the packet by mail. It gets <laughs> delivered, you know, by UPS two weeks later. And then oh my goodness. These forms get filled in and these forms have to come back. And the practitioner has to complete those forms and transpose them over. And yeah. It's a workflow, right? It's a workflow. So yeah. I think the uh, this whole notion of like you know we're in a different world these days, right? Yeah. It's all digital, it's all automated. We've got to get away from faxing and we get away from phone calling. If we have access to data, we should capitalize on that data and then save costs across the board and help yeah. people avoid injuries when possible. And if they get hurt, yeah. help them get back to work as quickly as quickly as they possibly can, and yeah. not let paperwork and administration be the bottleneck in people's lives. Because that's sort of the challenge that we deal with every day. That's that, that's a challenge that's common, uh, and, and I, I I hope it doesn't discourage founders. But um, you know, it, like I think, and it's not unique to the insurance industry, but because the insurance industry is one of the last to evolve, and in and in the case of uh, you know disability claims, uh, you're interacting with the medical industry as well. So now you've got all these stakeholders that you kind of have to rally. And they're, they have different workflows and standards and processes, and some are more advanced than others. Um, and the willingness to adopt new things is not always going to necessarily be high. So um, that is something that we hear a lot of. And it's sometimes it's just a matter of not being able to connect with a, a management system because there's no API capability. Um, but, you know, the f- medical industry can be very fragmented. So I, I imagine that can be frustrating at times. Maybe we'll come back to that. But what I, what I want to talk about um, to start now, because you mentioned my abilities. So mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about like, what's the elevator pitch for my abilities? Uh, and tell us a little bit about, you know, why did you start my abilities? What problem did you seek out to solve with this solution? So basically, my abilities is all about helping employers understand the, the demands of their jobs make sure that their ergonomics of the workplace is is safe for workers yeah. to perform those duties of those jobs. And then un- make sure that the, p- the employees doing those jobs have the physical and mental and cognitive capabilities to meet those demands. If, if they don't, then ob- obviously they should either modify their ergonomics itself and we could help them do that or... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, give the individual employees some conditioning programs or some strategies to, so that they can actually meet those demands. If the employee defor- performing a job doesn't have the capabilities to meet those requirements of that job, at some point sooner or later, there's going to be an injury claim. Yeah, And that's a liability for the employer, and that's an issue for the carrier, and that's an issue mm. for the injured worker. So this whole notion of, of uh, accommodation and job compatibility is at the heart of what we do at my abilities. So understand what, what's required of that job and make sure the workers you're hiring or placing in that job have the ability to meet those demands. So right. that's key. Uh, almost all employers um, mm-hmm. in a large number have absolutely no idea what the job entails yeah. and how demanding a job may be. So they focused on your application and your resume and they put you on the job, but within a short period of time, now yeah. they get our injury, injury claim that they have to deal with. So now they got lost productivity. They've got some costs that they incur. Uh, you got an employee who's off and, and the cycle continues. Right, right. So what the heart of our system is, look, let's help you define your job. Let's help you understand them. Let's help you build a library of those job descriptions. Um, give you, make it visual. 
and let's let you action them. Give them, give access to your physical therapy clinics, give access to your ergonomists, give access to your carrier, give access to the physicians who are helping you, whether they're occupation or otherwise, to get a better sense of what ha- what's happening within the workplace and, and the kind of people that need to come in to meet those demands of those particular jobs. So that's sort of one part of what my ability does. It's really on the understanding, defining, um, documenting, and standardizing the requirements of work. The other part is uh, accidents always happen. And, and it's, yeah. as much as we can help reduce them, they still occur occasionally. And so when they do occur, leveraging the exact same technology to bring people back to work as quickly as, as we can. Mm-hmm. So informing the physicians, right? A lot of times when you when an injury occurs, it's the physician that asks the, the injured worker, hey, you know, what do you think your job entails? What do you think you have to lift? And the, the injured worker always exaggerates or has their own perception of the demands of the work. And they say, yeah, I lift 100 pounds all day long. And some, I lift it all in my holder and I carry it all day. Yeah, yeah. And the physician says, wow, if that's what you do, then you really can't go back to work because you're not yeah. able to do that. Yeah. So they have no other reference to say, no, that's not what your job description looks like. That's not what the data says. Yeah. Um, let me test you and see what you can do. So physicians don't have the time and the bandwidth to kind of figure that out. Yeah. So they rely on the patient for the most part, and that's half the problem. Right. So what we do is we we give the employer the ability to send this digital data to mm-hmm. a physician to say, here's what's required of this individual worker. Can right. you can you look at it and tell us if he can do these demands that are defined on this digital form? And now yeah. the physician has a reference point to say, yeah, can you lift 10 pounds? I think you can. Mm-hmm. Can you sit? I think you can. Can you, yeah. you know, stoop, bend, and so on and so forth? Now you've got an objective assessment from a physician that doesn't, doesn't, right. doesn't require the patient to interpret their own assessment yeah. and their own capability and their own job demands themselves. Right. And that's going to help protect the carrier. It's going to help protect the mm-hmm. employee. It's going to help protect the physician. But it's also going to help bring them back to work as quickly as you can because the physician can say look you can meet the demands of your job if not all of them you can meet 90 percent of them so if we could avoid you lifting 10 pounds and if we can get rid of that job job demand itself Hmm. you could you should still be able to do your job a modified version of it right but you should go back to you should be able to go back to work and do some other modified type job and get that information back to the employer to say okay bring them back but avoid this one task that requires them to lift 10 pounds because they can't lift 10. They're going to lift five. Right. Now there's a prescription to say, okay, we can accommodate. Mm -hmm. So it's all about accommodation. It's all about understanding. It's all about bringing the person back to work as quickly as they can, given their capacity, whatever that capacity is and knowing what that capacity is. Right. Do you, so there's a lot there and, and I can see how that would take, takes the guesswork out of that whole process. Um, and you know, all the ambiguities eliminated really does, um, does that record if employers are using it as part of their onboarding process, uh, when they're bringing on new staff, um, and this is mostly jobs that require manual labor, I, I assume, um, it, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say in manual labor or otherwise. We put, we have it for white collar and blue collar okay. office and, okay. and manual labor. Yep. Is it is it something that is typically updated? Is it dynamic? Or, or you know, what if I'm in that job for 20 years? Um, you know, that's that's a long period of time. But does that record get updated, or is it uh, is it uh, is it incumbent on the employer to uh, update the abilities, the capabilities, the physical demands of that particular job? Um, can you explain a little bit how that part works after the initial assessment is done? Yeah, conventionally, what some of the employers do is they have an ergonomist or a clinician or a practitioner come in every three years mm-hmm. and we evaluate all the jobs and produce new documentation and new physical demand analysis that they print or give them PDF files for. And okay. they go on somebody's drive. Or they they go to three week binder and they sit on somebody's shelf for three <laughs> years, yeah. Um, and that never really is utilized and, and meaningfully in any kind of way because some people forget to even do them after they spend substantial amount of cash on, on in right. investing and getting them. Um, the beauty of what we offer is that it's an online solution, 
So mm. as the job demands change, if you modify the job itself, yeah. if you modify workflow, or you modify a production line, or you mm. modify any update within the system, yeah. you could make those changes dynamically um, on okay. in the software. And it would actually immediately modify the demands within that job, but it actually impacts the entire risk profile analysis on the entire employee population mm. that gets impacted by that job. So a company can actually see the risk exposure globally, um, right. either at a department level, at a factory level, at a division level, or you know, at a national level to say, you know, where where is the risk exposure coming from from all of our employees? Mm-hmm. And in which department, in which division is giving us the higher exposure uh, right. based on the demand. And then they can see that information dynamically in real time. With okay. with the conventional process that happens today, it's all manual based. So there's no mm-hmm. analytics, there's no visibility, there's no uh, anal- there's no assessment. Um, you can't share the information and certainly you can't run analysis on um, a large number of locations because every location is siloed from another. And it's all paper-based, right? We can't run math on paper. No. Um, no. It's just not possible. Yeah. And that, so when, that's the process that we're trying to get rid of. So when, 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 when we look at the stage that the company is at, I'm curious to know uh, what types of customers are adopting the solution. Is it typically companies that have had a claim in the past and, you know, they've, they've been enlightened? Um, you know, what, what, what's the client profile look like as far as like the type of client that usually sees value in my abilities? Uh, it tends to be a much more of the progressive type client who wants to control their spend and control the bottom line. Mm. And they see disability and workers' comp as being uh, a liability and a cost they're trying to control. Right. Um, it tends to be a little bit more blue collar, but the, now with COVID and work from home, we're seeing mm-hmm. a lot more adoption on um, our white collar product called Rosa, where a mm-hmm. lot of employers are actually having employees, even though they work from home, mm-hmm. assess their work environment at home and look at the risk exposure of their home workstation. Right. Um, we're seeing much more adoption in that space. But as the employers start to return, as we're seeing right now, we're seeing a lot more employees saying, okay, we want to bring our workers back. Do they yeah. have the physical capacity to meet the demands of our job? And what is that physical capacity? Right. And getting getting that that workflow documented. So it tends to be companies who are cost sensitive, who are trying to who have large employee population. Um, if they've had previous injuries, then obviously they're a lot more motivated to reduce their exposure. Yeah. Um, but it's really across the board. You know, we've seen companies as small as 50 employees adopt the technology all the way up to national brands uh, that are across the country that have 10,000 plus employees adopt it. Right. And and as far as, uh, you know, the size of the company and, you know, getting getting a little bit more into the organizational structure, are you can, are you focused on the Canadian market specifically or uh, is, is my abilities offered in other markets outside of Canada? Yeah, we service a lot of companies in the U.S. right now. Um, we service companies in Canada. We've got clients in Australia, and okay. we've got a, a new uh, partner that's launching in uh, in the U.K. So we okay. like to think that right now we're sort of international. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. How long has it been on the market, Reed? So we started building it in late 2017, mm-hmm. uh, really commissioned in 2018, and yeah. and ironically launched it in February 2020. Okay. Um, probably be the worst time to launch the uh, <laughs> yeah. return, to work, return to work software solution during yeah. COVID when yeah. everybody's shutting down their operations and, and we had an injury prevention program. And yeah. I think COVID was the best injury prevention program because nobody was working um, right. yeah. in, in February and March. Um, so we sort of hybridated a little bit, focused on the innovation, kept the advancing mm-hmm. the technology. Yeah, and uh, sort of waited until the employers started re-enter, and now as yeah. we start to go back to work and open, employers are starting to open up. We're mm-hmm. sort of re-entering this space one more time. Talk about trying or having to pivot, right? Um, and you know, a, a good plans really never really go according to plan, hundred percent anyway. Um, so where where are you yeah, at as as far as funding? Sorry, you. Uh, yeah, I interrupted interrupt your thought there. You were going to say something? No, I was. I said I forgot to add in my uh, prospectus on the investment deck that uh, if there's a global pandemic, we need to account for that. And that yeah. was um, <laughs> my investor deck. 
Well, you know what? It is an interesting time to be raising funds uh, for sure, right? Um, because there's a lot of projections that maybe didn't come to fruition. I see that with a lot of early stage companies that I talk to. What stage would uh, would you say of my abilities is? Uh, have you guys have you have you done a round? Uh, are are you are you in fundraising mode right now? Um, are, and you know, is, are those funds being raised domestically, internationally? Are you going through traditional? Uh, investors, private investors. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we've been fortunate because we're backed by some very high net worth um, investors, seed investors that um, have a strong corporate profile in in Canada and the US. Um, They clearly understand what we're trying to do and they see the opportunity of how we can actually change workers' compensation and disability and, and injury prevention in the workplace. And they recognize that we're the only ones in our space doing what we do. Like literally, we are the only ones that have built a national job database uh, globally that can be accessed. Yeah. So we they're um, so they've been they've been great uh, financing the business and and putting capital in. Um, they understand the COVID situation that we're all going through, and they've been very patient on um, the growth of the company. And just recently closed an additional seed round um, with them and and additional new investors that we brought on that. Some are actually from the insurance tech business as well. Um, and now we're, our plans are to uh, to deploy the technology um, this quarter. We, we started to go out to market uh, early a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. hired some more sales and marketing uh, talent to actually start educating the marketing programs that we have. And of course, looking to raise some more capital. Um, you know, yeah. we're always looking to raise more capital so we can scale, um, you know, service the rest of the insur- insurance companies in Canada, work with more TPAs, both Canada and the U.S., and start talking to a lot of employers, whether they're self-insured or whether they're self-administered or whether they have a carrier or a broker. Um, work with them to help create awareness on on the solutions that we we have in market. Yeah. Um, you know, in Canada, we've got we've got you know a national broker that that is promoting our technology. We have a Canada's largest TPA that uses our system. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're in active discussions with a very large Canadian insurer that may adapt the technology in Q4 to launch it. On the U.S. side, we are we've got a contract with one of the largest TPAs in the world. On the U.S. side, who's who's using the platform? Fantastic. We've got national brands in in Texas. We've got national brands um, in California. We've got some significant um, brands that use our technology for prevention and return to work uh, currently, despite COVID and despite the early growth of our company. Yeah. Um, there's a fair bit of appetite and interest on the solutions that we're delivering and deploying right now. So as a Canadian founder, it sounds like, and this topic comes up a lot um, uh, in our interviews, uh, you were able to successfully raise funds here domestically in Canada. Um, Do you feel any pressure to have operations in other markets um, where your customers are? Or as a Canadian company, are are you able to successfully service the UK, the US, Australia from Canada? Where Where do you see that going long term? Yeah, the, the good thing about being a cloud-based, SaaS-based cloud solution company yeah. and our partners with Microsoft, because we're on the Azure platform, we're able right. to host our platform in any region that we have customers. So, I mean, we get to ask that question all the time, right? Yeah. Our data needs to reside on local soil. Yes. So we've got, we've got with Microsoft, our servers run on U.S. soil and Australia. They run in Australian soil and Canada, they run locally. Um, and we give our clients assurance that, yeah, your data is protected within your borders, segregated from other uh, employers and other clients within that region. So you've got the same assurances and same securities if you were to implement them your own and leveraging Microsoft and Azure to kind of give us that assurance and security. Right. As far as as far as far uh, sales and marketing, look, we're in a global market right now. We're in a, we're in a uh, cloud industry. I don't think anybody with COVID is really eager to start traveling and, and yeah. Being everywhere, everything that we're doing is remote, anyways, and it's it's helping our cause. Right. Um, you know, we're a cloud company, and we think we can service the globe, kind of where we are here in Toronto. We've got agents in different parts of the world. Um, yeah. We've got people in Australia. We've got people in the UK. We've got people in Toronto and Canada. We've got people in the US uh, to represent the product. But I think for the for, from the heart of the company is going to remain here. The engineer is going to remain here. Software development and research will continue to be Canadian. That's fantastic. And 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 what um, what would you say has been 
in in the journey that you've been on, and uh, I don't want to assume that it was the pandemic. What what has been your biggest challenge uh, in get getting my abilities to market, and you know, just you could be growing it, scaling it, could be a number of things. But what what would you say is the one that stands out? Well, the biggest challenge that we have, and mm-hmm. it's the barriers are getting a little easier now uh, post COVID. But the biggest challenge is process change. Right. Getting people to say, yeah, I've been doing it this way and yeah. I know your way is better, but that means I got to change. Yeah. And it's that transition. What's right? in it for me? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And, having, and having to learn, right. It's having to learn. Now I'm going to learn something. Right. New, right. I used to complete this piece of paper mm-hmm. for years and I just didn't know where to check off these boxes. Now I got to log in and complete this digital form is like, oh boy, you know, it's something new that I got to think about. Yeah. And that process change has been our biggest challenge. It isn't the software. It isn't the technology. Everybody knows it's going to solve a lot of problems. It's going to solve a lot of costs. But despite that, it's like, okay, but now I got to go learn it and use it. Yeah. It's like yeah. having a sports car in your garage and never using it. It's great to have a sports car in your garage, but if you can't take it for a drive, why are you, why, why are you investing in it? Yeah. So, so how are you overcoming that challenge? Are, are you tackling it by stakeholder group? Uh, you know, what, what's the silver bullet there? Are you, are, are you still looking for it? Yeah, we're still looking, we're still looking for it, believe it or not, ironically. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't quite found it yet, mm-hmm. but what we're doing is we're talking to employers and saying, look, we're, we, we plan to save you money. Yeah. Um, you know, the carriers, we're trying to give you more efficiencies. Mm-hmm. We, we've built APIs and we've built automation to integrate into your systems so that the learning curve is minimized. Right. And if you work with us and address, address the issues that you have, we will find technology solutions to kind of address those issues, to make the learning curve short yeah. and effective and quick. Like this is no different than what QuickBooks did. You know, QuickBooks came out mm-hmm. years ago and they tried, they launched auto- automated accounting. They didn't right. invent accounting. Accounting was being yes. done for, I don't know, how many years before QuickBook came out. Right. But I remember accountants had those green ledger books that they had to <laughs> post credits and credits on. And they're green and they visors. 50, yeah. 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 And they, they had 50 <laughs> clients and they had to carry 50 books and they needed an SUV to take them everywhere they had to go. Yeah. Yeah. And for the, yeah. lo- for the longest time, no accountant would actually subscribe to online anything because they're so comfortable. Yes. Know, all the manual entry the paper. And, yeah. 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 And then today, I don't know any accountant that still uses those green ledger books. Uh, yeah. I don't even think you can even buy those books anymore. Yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe in a museum somewhere. I don't know, but yeah, it's a good yeah. point. Yeah. That's a good, uh, that's a good analogy. So, um, and so do you think it's just, do you think it's just a matter of time? Like you're the, it, it sounds like you're the only companies you mentioned with the job database out there. It's going to come down to your customers pushing other stakeholders is what it sounds like, like pushing the medical community to adopt this and uh, for them to see the benefit. Um, but, you know, that ultimately takes time. So what do you what do you do? What do you do in the meantime? And do you find that the the customer um, like on the claim side, does this make does it make it easier for the customer to tell their story? Um, the person who's being treated, do you find adoption is high there or are they even really involved? It's just employer to practitioner and it's a direct line. It depends on the employee that's being treated. So mm-hmm. if, they, if they're motivated to return to work, it just makes it that much easier for them to understand the requirements of the job. Yeah, good point. And focus on, focus on rehabilitation and meeting those demands and going back to work. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. sort of one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, if you get a motiv- if you don't have a motivated employee who's actually trying to manipulate the system, mm. um, then it's more of a, a discussion between you know, the carrier, the healthcare provider, the employer to say, look, we understand we understand their capabilities from yeah. from their medical file. Mm-hmm. We we clearly have documented understand the demands of the job. Yeah. And we let the technology do the comparison. And then we think we can accommodate this injured worker and we should bring them back to work. It's their reluctance or resistance to go back to work. So yeah. it really does shorten the return to work cycle. It does take the financial pressure off the employers. Right. It does make the insurance company much more accountable on, on managing return to work. Mm-hmm. And it makes the injured worker, even though they're, they're resistant, it makes them much more accountable to have to 
take back their job and accommodate because of the medical data is showing that you have the ability to meet certain parts of your job, not all of it, Yeah. then why not go back to work and do those components of the job that you are capable of performing? Right, right. Yeah, that's, like I said earlier, that it really eliminates a lot of the ambiguity. Um, what, what advice would you give, uh, you know, my abilities uh, and, and, and you've had, you know, just as an entrepreneur, other companies uh, that you've launched successfully into the market. And if you want to mention those, feel free to at any time. But what advice would you give to anybody who's out there as a founder looking to, you know, launch the next startup in the insure tech space? Yeah, so it's a lot easier if you can find um, an early adopter, um, a mm. carrier, a TPA, a broker, somebody who would have the same kind of vision. Yeah. And and partner with you on on the adoption and the deployment, because right. then they've got a lot of muscle power and they can they can pull levers to get brand awareness and and help you launch the technology. Yeah, if you're trying to do it completely on your own, and then you're trying to t- change an entire industry, so it's you against the world, and yeah. it's still doable, one hundred percent doable, and it's been done, and it's always going to be doable, but it just takes a lot more effort and a lot more time and a lot more capital and a lot more resources to get it done. But if you can find an early adopter Mm -hmm. and make them your partner somehow or another, not necessarily from a corp structure point of view, but a a strategic alliance, Mm -hmm. then you find your job. It's going to be a lot easier because now you're sort of supporting their initiatives and leveraging their brand and the strategy and and their customer base to deploy your product. Yeah, that's good advice. And I think there might be some people that shy away from that either because they're worried about getting latched onto a whale client that like has so much control. Um, and I, and I won't mention any, so any people or conglomerates out there that treat their suppliers poorly, but there is a common analogy that is used. Um, or there's people that just have this traditional mindset of put as much into the top of the funnel as possible and, you know, try to convert you know, 10 to 3% at the bottom. Um, but it sounds like the approach that's worked for you is more of a laser focused kind of spear fishing approach. Um, like to, to find though that, that strategic partner, um, are you, you know, have you had to go out and talk to a hundred people to get the, that kind of a fit or, um, you know, is, is there a faster way to get to that? Is, is there a, a formula that you've, you've developed that is a much quicker, easier way to get to that strategic partner. Because I think that's some of the challenges, understanding like who, who needs this solution and, and who's, who, who need, where am I going to get that traction and, and, and where am I going to get that fit? Yeah, finding the whale is, is, is sort of the most difficult part. Mm. Um, not because you can't get to them, because they are a whale. And yeah. for them to adopt technology and innovation, there's a lot of red tape that you need to get through and a lot of people to get through before you can get something adopted. So I don't think that's probably the best strategy. Um, I think, you know, finding somebody the size of a salmon where they're Mm. smaller and and more nimble and you're able to negotiate with decision makers quickly and, you know, Mm -hmm. get three of those on, on, on your side. You probably can get a transaction done in a absolute fraction of the time and have much better negotiating power Less with, layers. with yes. mm-hmm. smaller groups and get a deal done. And then when you've got three or four of those happening and it's working and you've got some momentum and adoption, now the wheel is going to notice that something's happening in the industry. Right. Now you're in the negotiating position and the wheels are going to come to you saying, wait a second, you know, mm-hmm. can we, you know, can we cannibalize this? Can we uh, monetize this? Can we yeah. You know, take this on exclusively and then start negotiating. Yeah. Like, kind of let them come to you versus you have to go to them. Because yeah. if you have to go to the whales, you're going to spend mm-hmm. all of your time knocking on doors and it may not be as fruitful as you think it's going to be. And if it is, it's going to take you a very long period of time. Very wise. Uh, you, and you're basically, you're describing creating that pull effect, right? As, as opposed yeah. to uh, the, the push. Um, what do you want to be known for? Just kind of closing thoughts here. What do you want my abilities to be known for when, when, when people think about what you're doing? I want the people to recognize that ergonomics needs to evolve mm. like accounting has evolved. Yeah. 
And there needs to be a national standardization across the board that says, when you look at a job or a job description, here's where you find this data. And here's what you look for. Kind of like a report card. Right. Um, right now, it's an absolute fragmented industry. And every mm-hmm. practitioner has their own opinion. So it's yeah. an industry, but it's really not an industry. It's mm-hmm. an individual for the most part. Right. Um, we want to make sure that people who find jobs and work for companies have work safe work environments that are not exposed to kind of injuries. Mm. And if they get hurt, we want to make sure we help those individuals and the employers bring them back to work as quickly as we possibly can. Because the majority, if not all injured workers, really are motivated to get back to work and maintain their cash flow and take care of their families. Yeah, They don't really want to be off work um, post-injury. Um, we want to be known that the company that's going to help those people get back to work and find jobs that they can safely perform so that they can make an income and feed their family and continue with their life. That's the kind of organization we plan to build. That's awesome. And, you know, in in your mission to evolve the ergonomics industry uh, and help create safe workplaces, if if we can do our small part here to help you create more awareness around that um, and reach the stakeholders that you need to reach to kind of push that, that elephant up the hill. Um, you know, it, it was it was my pleasure to sit down with you and, and, and talk to you about the mission that you're on. And, and it's great to see another Canadian success story. Uh, would love to have a follow up conversation to talk about some of the other things that you're involved in um, on the on the sports side. But we'll we'll save that for another day. So thank you, Reed, for um, for sitting down with me today. Last thing, uh, where can we find you if, if someone's watching this or listening on one of our podcast channels? and they want to learn more, what's the best way to, to reach you? Uh, best way is our website. Uh, go to myabilities, myabilities.com. Perfect. One word. Awesome. awesome. Easy to remember. Thanks again, Reed. Have, have, have a good evening and, and enjoy the rest of your uh, your week. And uh, yeah, so just I'll, uh, a, close, a closing thought. I, a closing thought. I do have a pool in my backyard that I promise I'm going to learn how to swim this summer. <laughs> I think my wife, that's my commitment. And I, 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 I plan to do that. I was going to say, like, like talk about, you know, yeah. reverse engineering the whole thing. Let's go down to the bottom of the ocean without any gear on and then learn there how to go. swim afterwards. Exactly. So I go. love that. There but, you, you know, go. you know, like now I'm going to be thinking of you the next time I hesitate to try on a new challenge. Uh, there I'm you just going to think of Reed jumping into the ocean and saying, I'll That's figure it, it out. Just, right? Let's just, just let's yeah. just do it, man. Let's just do it. That's right. I, I love it. That's uh, yep. what I think that's the saying, uh, uh, Sir Richard Branson, screw it, let's do it, right? So uh, Yeah, exactly. 100%. You know, to have that attitude sometimes and throw the fear aside. So thanks again. Yep. 